Hello and welcome to Global Business, coming to you live from Nairobi. I am Penina Karibe. We begin with a look at the markets. The Egyptian exchange ended first session of the week on green amid Egyptian purchases. The benchmark EJ30 hiked 0.3% or 117.13 points to close at 14,366.06 points. Coming up on the show tonight. Africa's largest fund manager resigns amid corruption claims. Nissan drops the UK and turns to Japan for its new extra SUV. And this NGO finds eco-friendly ways to keep the streets of Niger squeaky clean. South Africa's Public Investment Corporation has been thrown into a $150 billion crisis following the resignation of its board of directors. The resignations come amid allegations of widespread corruption at the pensions fund. In the past year, half of the executive committee has been suspended or resigned. Africa's largest fund manager has been subjected to ongoing investigations regarding the bonds of Eskom Holdings and technology company IO Technology Solutions. The PAC says it has immediately started a forensic investigation into allegations of impropriety made by an anonymous whistleblower against three board members. South Africa's finance minister Tito Mweni has reportedly began a search to replace the directors. Let's go live to Angela Coppola in Johannesburg for more on this. Angela, what impact does this mass resignation of the board of directors have on the management of the PIC? Well, look, at the moment, that remains unclear. Uh, we haven't heard from the finance minister yet either, which is a little disconcerting. As the political head of the PIC, one would have expected a response of sorts. His deputy, the now ex-chair, said late on Friday that the finance minister, Tito Maweni, had had some options that he was looking at, but that was it. The operational teams at the PIC are probably in a bit of disarray at the moment. The mass resignation comes after the resignation of that long-time CEO late last year. That's in November. The commission starting, which happened about four weeks ago, and those whistleblower emails. So the lack of news and any information or any type of leadership has to be disconcerting to staff. Operationally, though, the business can function, but a lack of guidance from the board on big picture issues remains an issue, Vanina. And Angela, there's been concerns the CEO's stay at the helm of the PIC may hinder the Commission of Inquiry from effectively con conducting its investigations. So do we know the final report should be, uh, we know it should be out in April, but do we know if the Commission has uncovered anything substantial? Well, look, the acting CEO has had unspecified allegations leveled against him by that whistleblower. Uh, these were considered serious enough to force the ex-board to institute a forensic investigation led by an independent lawyer. It's unclear whether that investigation has actually started or not, what the terms of reference are, and whether there's a deadline that's been put in place or not. As to whether his remaining in place will affect the commission, that remains to be seen as well, which, which raises the question, of course, whether he should voluntarily step down or whether the finance minister via his new board should actually suspend him. It's messy either way. In terms of uncovering anything, last week we saw a paper audit trail of the decision-making process around that disputed AO investment, which points to serious governance lapses at the very least, Penina. And Angela, the alleged corruption at the PIC involves astronomical sums of money. Are we likely to see culprits being prosecuted and jailed? Well, look, this commission follows the rules and regulations that are set in place by the Commission's Act in South Africa. So the preliminary report we know is due out later this month. That will provide some guidance about who may, may or may not be held responsible for those lapses in governance. The allegations of corruption or fraud, if shown to have any merit, could lead to the National Prosecuting Authority investigating the matter. But evidence presented at the Commission can't be used directly to help the NPA there. The Commission itself can't prosecute um, anybody. They can recommend a type of sanction or a prosecution or the NPA to investigate further. Um, but that's as far as their uh, sort of uh, responsibilities go. They can look at company law and apply some issues there, which relate specifically to disciplinary action. 
Um, when that's likely to happen is anyone's guess, of course. In terms of civil prosecution, there's likely to be even a longer time frame before anything happens there, if, especially if one considers how much time it's taken, some 10 years, to get the ex-president Jacob Zuma to have his day in court concerning the arms deal scandal. So it's early days, prosecution possible later by the NPA, but for now, the Commission has to finish its work and present its report. Panina. Uh, so, Angela, the Finance Minister has reportedly began the process of getting a new team. Uh, do we have names and when this could be concluded? Well, look, his challenge is finding a chair for his board. Um, alternatively, he's got to find nine people to steer the PIC out of its current morass and then allow that group to elect their own chair. It's unclear if he can appoint a chair now that the deputy finance minister has removed himself from the equation. It's precedent setting, uh, not having a deputy finance minister in charge of the PIC board. There's also no doubt that the appointment will be a political deployment, um, I've been told. And there's speculation about lots of names that have been thrown into the hat, specifically one um, soon-to-be ex-APSA bank CEO. But again, no confirmation of names. But it is hoped that in the next day or two, the finance minister will come out with that list of people he wants to see on that board at the PIC. Panina. All right, Angelo Coppola, live for us there in Johannesburg. Many thanks, Angelo. Now, a Maltese port manager has been shot dead in Somalia's northern semi-autonomous Puntland state. Paul Anthony Formosa, who was the construction project manager for DP World, was killed near Bosaso Port. Islamist militant group Al-Shabaab has claimed responsibility for the attack. Formosa was manager for PNO Ports, which is a subsidiary of the Dubai-based DP World, one of the world's largest port operators. Let's get more details now from CGTN's Abdulaziz Bilo. He's live for us from Somalia's capital, Mogadishu. Abdul, it seems the port manager was deliberately targeted by the Al-Shabaab. Do we know why? Well, Penina, uh, this attack is not uh, that unique here in Somalia. Militant group Al-Shabaab, as we know time and again, they have targeted foreign nationals here on different capacity, be them working for the UN, some of them working as NGOs, and uh, some of them, even experts who have been brought here by the Somali government, they've all fallen vulnerable to a militant group attack. But what stand out, stands out rather in this latest attack is the fact that uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Farmaso, who was killed by Al-Shabaab today, uh, is the, the manager of a PN all ports as you've said that's a subsidiary of a uh, dubai world a port uh, the biggest port operator one of, one of the biggest port operators in the world now it owns uh, the lease uh, for 30 years to run the port of bosaso and another one in uh, in berbera that is towards uh, northern somalia in somalia now part of those deals is to create a naval uh, base for Afri for to, to train somali forces to tackle insurgent groups like al shabaab and isil so uh, automatically these uh, makes them a threat to al shabaab because al shabaab sees the existence of deep world as a threat to its own existence so that's why it targeted Mr. Formaso today and the Al Shabaab spokesperson was very clear in his statement today he said that they targeted uh, DP world because they failed to heed their warning one and second they didn't want uh, foreign companies to take advantage of the uh, lack of strong central government in Somalia to come here and plunder uh, the natural resources of Somalia okay so you mentioned those two deals that DP world had uh, the Somali government, however, do we know, it declared the deal between DP World and Puntland as null and void and subsequently Parliament passed a bill banning DP World from Somalia. So question is, what is the framework under which DP World runs that BUSA support? Well, uh, Beatrice, uh, Penina, that's a good question. Uh, uh, authorities here in Somalia in March of 2018 banned uh, DP World from operating in Somalia, be it in Mogadishu or any other autonomous region, Somaliland or Puntland. But uh, one thing to note is uh, a DP World CEO in an interview with the BBC a few uh, months back before Somalia declared it null and void, he issued a statement on live TV where he said that uh, the regional uh, authority in Somaliland that considers itself an autonomous uh, uh, region out of Somalia as an independent state. Say uh, the D DP World CEO said that Somaliland is independent and it can enter deals with Somalia. So that's one of the reasons as to why the Somali government uh, declared null and void the contract between Ethiopia, DP World, and Somaliland to upgrade the port of Berbera at a cost of $400 million. Now, part of that program also included the creation of an army base there to train Somaliland forces better to protect. Uh, better protect their own security and tackle any insurgency group that might come their way. So 
for Puntland case, it's quite different. It's because of the fallout of the federal member states with Mogadishu as to why Puntland decided to go uh, support UAE instead of uh, being neutral, as Somalia said, in the Gulf crisis. So the former president of Puntland, Abdiweli Mohamed Ali, is the one who signed that deal. And because of the fallout of Mogadishu, that's why Puntland and Somaliland uh, uh, rather remained with DP World because they sided with UAE over Mogadishu's neutral stance in the Gulf crisis. So these are the uh, political dynamics here, the Gulf powers, they influenced these regional states to side with them. And that's why Puntland and Somaliland, they have the deal with DP World for 30 years. So what is the likely impact of this killing? How does it affect the port operations? Well, Penina, one, uh, after the attack today here, uh, it will uh, bring to question as to how these uh, DP World and PO ports want to run their activities here in Somalia. One, they will have to reconsider their approach, whether they want to stay in Somalia or they don't want to stay in Somalia. If they pick the latter and they want to stay in Somalia, then they will have to increase their security so that they can not fall vulnerable to such an attack where an Al-Shabaab militant can enter a highly guarded port in uh, northern Somalia and kill the man manager there so they will have to increase uh, their security or seek security assurances from respective regional authorities that is Puntland and uh, Somaliland so that they can continue to stay there and then again this will impact of course uh, the, the insecurity will impact the process that uh, the DP World has taken to progress the ports in Berbera and in Bosaso and the fact that it will take more time to expand this port means that they will have low volumes of trade in this er region so it might in turn affect the region's economy Puntland and Somaliland and it might it forced these two administrations uh, to reconsider whether they can hire a different farm or continue uh, and stick with a DP world. All right, Abdulaziz Bilo live there in Mogadishu. Thank you. Let's now have a look at your corporate headlines. MTN has announced that it expects improvements of at least 20% for both headline and attributable earnings per share for the year ending December 2018. The share price of the telecom giant has recently declined following its ongoing tax dispute in Nigeria. MTN is expected to face a Nigerian court later this week of an allegation it owes $2 billion in taxes in its biggest market. South Africa's struggling power utility ESCOM is expected to make a wider loss of about $1.5 billion in the current 2018-2019 fiscal year. The firm is drowning in around $31.3 billion of debt at the moment. After a decade of steep decline, ESCOM supplies more than 90% of South Africa's power and is vital to the health of Africa's most industrialized economy. Transnet has issued eight of its senior executives with letters of precautionary suspension. The decision comes as a result of past internal audit and forensic reports that were not implemented by the company's management. The named officials have been given 48 hours to respond and give reasons to why they should not be suspended. And the president of Dangote Group, Aliko Dangote, has disclosed that premium motor spirit from Dangote Refinery will not be sold at the regulated price of Nigeria's federal government. Instead, Aliko plans to sell his petrol at export rate. Dangote Refinery is expected to become one of the world's biggest refineries upon its completion. And that's a wrap of your corporate news. You're watching Global Business. We're taking a break, but don't go far. We shall have plenty more when we come back. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global Business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast. Sharp and insightful global business only on cdtn every story starts out like this okay. we'll beyond the rush of the numbers there's always a more fundamental question what happened who has been affected? When market moving decisions are made, who's responsible and why? Let's get some reaction on ground. Joining us in Johannesburg is 
Hello, this well, is how all stories begin. See how they end. Only on Global Business. For decades, scientists working here have unearthed the remains of ancient man buried deep underground. But that's not all there is to Kenya's Turkana County. From February 5th, join CGTN's Wilkista Nyabwa for our six-episode series as she explores the cradle of mankind. Let's break up for the news making headlines this hour. A multi-sport manager has been shot dead in Somalia's northern semi-autonomous Puntland state. Paul Anthony Formosa, who was the construction project manager for DP World, was killed near Busaso port. Islamist militant group Al-Shabaab has claimed responsibility for the attack. South Africa's public investment cooperation has been thrown into a $150 billion crisis following the resignation of its board of directors. The resignations come amidst allegations of widespread corruption at the pensions fund. The past year, half of the executive committee has been suspended or resigned, including the CEO. Kenya's foreign direct investments flow reduced by 57.1% to an estimated $0.3 billion in 2018. It had previously registered $0.7 billion in 2017. This is according to a report by the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. In total, Eastern African nations attracted an estimated $6.8 billion in investment. However, the UN Trade Agency says this was a 14% reduction from the $7.9 billion in 2017. And that's a wrap of the top stories this hour. Nissan has cancelled plans to make its x trail SUV in the UK. This is a sharp blow to British Prime Minister Theresa May, who fought to have the model built in northern England. Falling demand for diesel cars in Europe has forced Nissan to cut hundreds of jobs at its Sunderland factory in the north of England. Nissan also plans to consolidate production of the next generation x trail at its plants in Kyushu, Japan. This has made undisclosed concessions designed to ensure the car maker's ability to compete after Brexit. But it concerns me that they have noted the, the uncertainty around Brexit and I think that is a serious signal to all of us uh, in Parliament that now is the time to resolve that uncertainty so it doesn't uh, impinge on any decisions in the future. People can invest with confidence uh, in Britain uh, knowing with confidence that we're going to be able to, uh, to trade as we have without tariffs and without frictions with the rest of Europe. Let's get more from Richard Bestick, who's live for us in London. So, Richard, was the change of heart by Nissan about Brexit or is there more to this? Well, that's the business secretary, Greg Clark, there saying that it's set against the background noise of Brexit. Certainly when Nissan announced its change of heart at the weekend, the company said no more than that uncertainty around the UK's future relationship with the EU wasn't helping. So although Brexit uh, has played its part, there are other elements involved here. The downturn in sales of diesel vehicles has hit the industry, for example. And at the same time, uh, projected sales of future models like that X Trail uh, would, that would have been manufactured in Sunderland have slowed. So, for business reasons, says Nissan, it's just not worth their while to open up another production line in Britain. Brexit, though, is there in the background, uh, and uh, that is worrying uh, for those uh, MPs, members of Parliament, and the government looking at a 
clock ticking down to exit from the European Union with no withdrawal agreement uh, in the bag. Uh, what impact will this decision have on Britain's auto industry? Well, there's no doubt that the decision is a further blow to the UK car industry. It's got to be said that um, the j jobs that would have come from this new X-Trail model would have been additional jobs, around about 700. But um, Ford, Jaguar, Land Rover and Honda have all reduced their workforces and cut costs. Uh, Britain's uh, business secretary admits that the cancellation of the new model in Sunderland is, quote, very bad news. Uh, he suggests that it's a warning sign of the damage that could be done to the auto industry if there was no deal Brexit. Um, Sunderland, in Sunderland, uh, it, it appears Clark is suggesting that it's indicative of a future trend, and if that's the case, a future trend in, across the industry, and if that's the case, then the damage could be immense. It could be very high for the British economy, which depends on a thriving auto industry. All right, so Richard, how much is this uncertainty over Brexit eroding investor confidence? Well, it is, all, and, and Panina, you're right, it is already eroding confidence. According to analysis by the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, investment has effectively fallen off a cliff, dropping by more than half. Production has uh, fallen to a five-year low. The industry, it's suggested by the SMMT, is waiting to see what happens in Brexit. And that's according to Mike Hawes, the chief executive of the organisation. He told me uh, that the industry is very worried indeed about what could happen. Uh, he says it's already done enormous damage, but uh, nothing compared yet to the devastation that could be caused. So the Leave and Remain MPs, Richard, have been meeting for the first time today to discuss alternative arrangements to the Irish backstop. Have there been any positive signs? Yeah, the fact that they're meeting is positive, um, I suppose you could argue. They uh, met for two and a half hours uh, this afternoon um, and nothing concrete was agreed. These... Uh, these are members, both Brexiteers and Remainers, from the uh, ruling Conservative Party in Britain, factions at daggers drawn, uh, with the catchily named Alternative Arrangements Working Group. It's a product of the so-called Malt House Compromise, and while that might sound like one of those cheap spy novels you buy at airports, it is in fact uh, something brokered by Housing Minister Kit Malthouse, bringing together warring Brexiteers and Remainers inside the uh, Conservatives to see if they can come up with something, some compromise to the Brexit withdrawal agreement, which has been so resoundingly rejected uh, by Parliament. It's got a good head so far within the ranks uh, of the Conservative Party. The big test, of course, will be when it hits the reality of the European Union in Brussels, where reportedly, Benina, it's known among officials as uh, not the Malt House of Compromise, but as the bonkers no deal plan. You pays your money and you takes your choice, I suppose. Mm -hmm. All right, Richard, thank you very much for talking to us. Richard, best declare for us in London. The Chinese New Year is almost upon us, and with it comes the year-end Spring Festival bonuses. Workers in China will now be able to save a good deal of money following the implementation of China's new tax policy. Here's CGTN's Mijiai with that story. Employees at Haobai Fan Sales in Shanghai's Hongkou district are looking forward to their year-end Spring Festival bonus. They'll receive an average of 60,000 yuan, and that means a lot of individual income tax to pay. This year, though, the company's financial director has been doing some figuring to help her employees take advantage of the new tax policy to save some money. In the past, a year-end bonus was counted separately from the monthly income, while the new policy counts the bonus as part of the yearly income. Employees have a three-year grace period in which they can continue filing tax in the old way if they like, and making the right choice can have a big effect on the amount of taxes they pay. 
For an employee whose monthly salary is 30,000 yuan, the year-end bonus is 60,000. If we calculated it on the new policy, that would be a tax on the total annual income of 420,000 yuan. So setting aside the exemptions, this employee would have to pay 12,700 yuan on the bonus. That's a 7,000 yuan difference. So the three-year grace period has really given the employees a big bonus. The new tax policy also adjusts the tax rates for different levels of incomes. In the past, most of the employees here would have had to pay a 25% income tax. But now many of them will have to pay only 20% or 10%. Cho says that will reduce the total amount of individual income taxes paid by the company's employees by 30 to 40%. Haobai Fund is not the only company benefiting from the new policies. But just to make sure their numbers are correct, many people are coming into local tax offices to be sure they understand how things will work this year. The most concerning issue for taxpayers is which method they should use to file for the tax on the year-end bonus. We suggest that people with a high monthly income file it separately, while people with relatively low monthly incomes file the bonus together with annual income. That way, most people will save on their taxes. The government has also introduced additional exemptions for taxpayers, including for expenses on children's education, health care, continuing education, elderly care, and housing. Apart from individual income taxes, New deductions for companies are expected to be released in early February. The government estimates that China's tax cut came to more than 1.3 trillion yuan, or nearly 190 billion U.S. dollars, in 2018. Mi Jiayi, ICS for CGTN, Shanghai. The generation under the age of 30 has become a major force in driving the growth of consumption in China, with increasing demand for personalized experience and efficiency. They tend to emphasize quality and outstanding consumer experience and personality. Let's take a closer look at how the focus on food is changing in modern times. Into is an app focused on introducing the latest and most fashionable trends in cities around the world and it provides exactly what the younger generation seeks. Users are able to use it to find the most popular restaurants, boutique shops and other high-quality services. It is an app that integrates information on urban lifestyle and the latest trends around the world. Currently, we provide information on the most popular places and services, latest fashion art trends and interesting restaurants and cafeterias of more than 40 cities. Improving offline business through big data and artificial intelligence has become a major opportunity for the development of catering businesses. Social media, an increasingly indispensable part of our daily lives, has become an effective channel for these businesses to attract and retain customers. Li Mi Shiji, while making full use of the internet, says it offers consumers eco-friendly products and promotes the concept of safe food. As we wanted to directly link producers with consumers, e-commerce becomes the best choice. Therefore, we established Yimi Shiji. We have more than 1,000 products on the platform with detailed information of their origin, production methods, and nutritious facts. Each product is given an ID that can be traced back to their origins. With an accelerated pace of life and consumption, statistics show that Chinese consumers are willing to spend 37% of their total consumption on catering showing just how important the industry is to daily consumption. Against such a backdrop, the catering industry has embraced an era of diversity. Kobe is an online platform providing local services established by Alibaba and Ant Financial. Kobe was established in 2015. In 2017, we proposed the idea of integrated marketing, which means we could hold restaurant and shop owners to attract and retain consumers apart from providing payment supports. In 2018, we decided that it was mature for us to promote the concept of digitalization, as we have the capability and opportunity to ensure that users are willing to use our services. Therefore, in this stage, we launched online order and pre-order services in an aim to digitalize the whole industry and realize standardization and industrialization of the catering industry. In the catering industry, restaurants offering simple snacks and light meals are developing rapidly. 
young people don't have a clear preference for big brands. Instead, small and medium-sized restaurant chains are becoming very popular among the youth. Today, what attracts consumers are the colours and shades of the restaurants, innovative menus and new dishes, as well as their interior design. In China, there is a saying, as long as you have good products and services, people will come naturally. However, it may not work in reality. Therefore, the internet could be a helpful tool to direct consumers to the best products and services. It provides a convenient information channel that delivers detailed information of a restaurant to consumers very quickly. While linking offline restaurants with the internet, Kobe is establishing intelligent restaurants to help the traditional catering industry finish their digitization upgrades through the application and innovation of four core technologies, namely AI, big data, facial recognition, and conscious payments. The basic concept of new retailing is to realize the reconstruction of the relation between humans, products, and space with big data. It is impossible for the catering industry to get rid of the constraint of space without pursuing this model of retailing. A shared challenge for restaurants is that the growth of rent and labor costs always outpaces the growth of profit. Rapid growth of online shopping has provided a new form of exposure for restaurants of all sizes. The transition from offline to online operations has become an inevitable trend for the traditional catering industry that could effectively drive revenue growth for the industry as a whole. According to statistics, the market value of takeaway food apps has already exceeded 200 billion RMB and it will continue to grow. Rory Cohn, CGTN. The southern Chinese city Guangzhou has the romantic nickname Flower City. It celebrates the Chinese New Year with flower fairs. Our reporter Gu Yunfei has been finding out more about the tradition. Northern China may still be graped by the winter chill, but the city of Guangzhou in the south is filled with colors of beautiful flowers. Throngs of people flock to the annual Spring Festival flower fairs in the city for the three days before the dawn of the Chinese New Year. We've bought lots of things like decorations and clothes. And also we bought some pinwheels, which are supposed to bring good luck. I come to the flower fair every year, and this year there are more kinds of flowers and much more people than ever. Guangzhou is often called Flower City thanks to its abundance of colorful plant and tree life, and a year-round climate conducive for growing. Many flowers have their own significance in Chinese tradition. This flower is Pnoi Chrysanthemum, which stands for wealthy and auspicious life, and this flower is called Lucky Bird, which represents fortune and good luck. Flower Fair is an event rich in history, steeped in tradition, and is seen as a joyful gathering. Just on the first day, more than 1.3 million people visited the fair, and among them is one special group of children. These kids in traditional costumes are performing the ancient etiquette of welcoming guests. I come to the flower fair to buy gifts for my parents. They are still working right now. It's the first time most of them have been to the flower fair in Guangzhou. Most of them are the children of the city's migrant sanitation workers. We brought them from their hometowns to Guangzhou to spend the festival with their parents. We hope everyone in the city can enjoy the same happiness. And that's a worthy sentiment. During China's most important holiday, everyone deserves the same jubilation that comes from reunions. Gu Minfei, CGTN, Guangzhou. Let's have a look at commodity prices and all hit a two-month high, close to $64 a barrel today, as overclared supply cuts and U.S. sanctions against Venezuela's petroleum industry offset forecasts of weaker demand and an economic slowdown. Gold prices, however, slipped to their lowest in nearly a week as global stocks farmed an upbeat economic data from the U.S. and a stronger dollar. Still ahead on Global Business. We check out an NGO that uses eco-friendly ways to keep the streets of Niger squeaky clean. And Chinese people living in Africa gear up for the year of the pig. Images may appear to be identical, 
but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better. See GTN. See the difference. Niger has recently launched a waste recovery unit to turn tons of waste into cobblestones. These cobblestones allow arranging the public spaces or the streets of the Nigerian capital. ACGTN's Terry Wangari with more. It is through the NGO Waste Management and Recovery, GVD Africa, that the operation of waste collection and processing is organized in the city of Niamey. More than 1,000 tons of garbage is picked up daily in the Nigerian capital. According to the initiators, the transformation of waste into cobblestones makes it possible to find a more ecological alternative to cement and concrete. The trigger dates from 1999. The idea was to see what can be made from waste. The idea of taking the garbage then take them somewhere to be buried. It was necessary to leave this traditional method and to see how to constitute a source of income to answer a social need in terms of material products or in terms of energy or agricultural inputs. By transforming the waste into other types of products, it allows the recovering of the waste in nature. It allows us to clean up our environment and give farmland back to producers, pastures to livestock producers, because there's a lot of degraded land due to plastic. The process of turning waste into cobblestones begins with the mixing of plastic and sand in a furnace heated above 150 degrees Celsius. This mixture is then poured into molds to form the cobblestones. In the capital near May, many praise the virtues of this initiative. Today, there are several waste recovery units in Niger and in several countries of the sub-region. In Niamey, young people are even trained in recovery techniques to perpetuate the concept. The NGO GVD Africa, for its part, is currently working on the development of other products based on recycled waste, such as slabs for toilets, gutters and latrines. Terry Wangari, CGTN. The Chinese New Year marks the start of the Year of the Pig in Kenya. A group of Chinese citizens who can't go back home are preparing to celebrate the day in their own unique way. Citizens Wilkis Tanyabor has more. This kitchen is at the heart of all family celebrations. It is where Meng Xiangrong and her son Liu Yimengan have spent numerous evenings preparing meals for birthdays and special events. And now they are preparing for the bigger celebration of all, the Chinese New Year. Meng has lived in Kenya for 17 years. She moved to the capital, Nairobi, to set up her business importing and selling goods from China. Liu joined her five years later. He runs a charitable organization that teaches Kenyan youth to create employment opportunities. This year, the Chinese New Year or Spring Festival will fall on the 5th of February, but mother and son can't make it back home to China for the festivities. Most of the time uh, in Kenya, busy, the most busy time is, is right now because Christmas has just passed, so all the business and all the things just have started. So it's very busy, so sometimes it's quite difficult to go back. They will, however, take a break from work on the day. Even away from home, they are keen to honor the traditions of the day. I want uh, at the force 
of the new year, the four days, we already have a party with some other people in another uh, place. Then they will come here to join us. On the eve of the Chinese New Year's Day, Chinese families usually gather for the annual reunion dinner. It is also traditional for every family to clean their house in order to sweep away any ill fortune and make way for good luck. The pair has no relatives in Nairobi, so the dumplings they make will be shared with friends. Because dumplings look like uh, the gold uh, bricks in, in the ancient China, which was used to be the currency. So by eating the dumplings shows maybe the next year there will be a good wealth uh, to the family. Later in the year, Liu hopes to make his annual visit to China. But during this special time, he and his mother are content to make new memories in their home away from home. Time spent with friends and family and meals shared together are the essence of the Chinese New Year. And even away from home, Chinese nationals prepare to mark this special holiday. Wilkerson Abu CGTN in Nairobi, Kenya. And finally, a look at the currencies. The Kenyan shilling strengthened to its strongest level in six months against the dollar today due to hard currency inflows from horticulture exports and offshore investors buying government debt. Amid thin oil imported demand, South Africa's brand is as a strong dollar and U.S. Treasury yields holding recent gains put pressure on emerging market currencies. Let's leave it there for tonight and Global Business. We welcome your feedback. Send it to the contacts on the screen and follow us on our digital media platform. I am Penina Karibe, thank you for watching.